the normal force will rule your day. Yeah, you guys might know what I'm talking about. Oops, sorry, man. Smash. I also have a question on the um, number 60 on 2 3 1. Alright, so I got 3 1, number 60. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Alright. That one looks exciting. Alright, so I'll get you guys. Um, actually, let me see. Did anybody do 3 1, number 60 and feels like you got it? Um. Section three one number sixty. It says to find the, the, the tangent, like, right? Yeah. Well, no, no, no. So this one says find equations of both lines through the point two negative three. The tangent and that are tangent to this parabola. Yeah. Well, all right. So if it's tangent to that parabola. It has to have a slope, I think this might be what you're saying, a slope that is related to that parabola. It comes from the parabola, right? So you know how to get the slope. Yeah, yeah, it's a good first step. So the parabola they give us is this guy. And let me see if I can draw a semi-decent picture of this. So it goes through 0, 0. Uh, when x is 1, it goes... When x is 1, is 2. And the vertex is at... Uh, Negative one half, I think. Does that look right? Probably not. So it's negative b over two a, so negative one half, uh, and then whatever that is when you plug that back in. Uh, okay, so it's a negative one half. Uh, when you plug it in, you get negative. You get one fourth minus one half is negative one fourth. I don't know if you guys. I'm just trying to graph this semi decently, real quick. And what's the other um, uh, x-intercept? Negative one. Negative one. Cool. So that looks decent. And we're talking about, ooh, that looked okay, and then it just <laughs> fell apart. Uh, it's because of my freaking scale. Is that one, Jeff? Screw it, Jeff. All right. <laughs> two, and then the point two, negative three, which somehow is way the hell out there. Two, negative three. So there's two tangent lines. There's one that, that will hit it here, and there's one that's going to hit it somewhere here. And if I drew better, it would be a little bit better visually. You can put it into your calculator and see what's going on. So that's why you have a, a, let me just a parabola at a point. It could be tangent there, and it could be tangent somewhere here or somehow. Right, it's not a great representation, but that's the idea. That's why there could be two tangent lines to a curve that goes through a point. Because this guy's got two sides to it in a way, right? So you're like, all right, so what the hell? So what is the slope of that parabola everywhere? 2x plus 1x. Yeah, f prime will be 2x plus 1 to gas. Because the 1 would come down, the power would go down to 0, x to the 0 is 1. You guys with me? So would you plug it in? That's the slope. Alright, so that's, that's so far we know the slope everywhere. Uh, so, what, what, what's the answer? I love doing that. Yes, yeah. Okay, so for the work, um, would you just want us to show that we derived the equation, or do you also want us to graph it? Like this is just the visual. I was trying to make a visual, and then I screwed my scale up. But this is the idea. This is why it makes sense. When you first read through it, it I, I would assume it probably didn't make sense to a few of you guys mm -hmm. how there could be a couple. What the hell are they talking about? But that's the idea. You can come at, you can have a tangent line here that goes through a point, and then a tangent line there that goes through a point, just because your curve, your function is cur turning. So that's why it's possible. So are you going to plug in a y plus three equals two x plus one times whatever? Where did y plus three come from? Two Oh, I see. I see. Don't do that to yourself. No, 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 no. No, you, you. All right. Here's the next step. Here's the next step. This is all about, uh, all right, so I know the slope at my point has to be this. So let's say the point where this works is the point is x equals a. So what's this? Which is? 
A squared plus A. Beautiful. That's f of x, so you know what it is everywhere. A squared plus A. All right, and this is the point again. This is the point 2, negative 3, right? Yes. So what is the slope between those two points? 2 minus A. And what's that slope supposed to equal? What do I know the slope is supposed to be at A? 2x plus 2. 2a plus 1. So you have a slope that you can get from this. It has to equal the slope that you know it is. And see where that takes you. That's what you're doing. The slope of the tangent line, you can get it two ways. It's got to go through this point, right? Stay with me now. Whenever in math you can get the same thing two ways, you can set those two things equal to each other because it's supposed to be the same thing, right? So that happens a lot in math. So how can I find the slope of a line going through that point and that point? Y2 minus Y1, yay. What's another way I can do it? Calculus, yay. Two different approaches, supposed to be the same damn answer, so they better equal each other. So you're gonna have two A plus one equals Y2 minus Y1 with this stuff. So you're saying that we have to find the tangent for both equations and see if it... No, what this is gonna happen is you're gonna have a quadratic and you're gonna get two answers because you can factor it or quadratic formula it. I guess. Isn't that the slope, not the tangent line? Exactly. But the tangent line, what will the slope be? There will be two different ways to do it. This way and this way. You set the meet, which is, uh, you get the slope. And why, do, is, why is that all you need? Because what two things do you need for the equation of any line? What well, two things do you need for the equation of any line? Slope? Wow. And a point. I got, they gave me the freaking point. So what's the only thing I'm missing is slope. And then I can put my equation together. So don't stop when you find the slope. That won't be the answer. That's what you're saying. The answer is the equations of the tangent lines. But that's your point right there. So plugging 2 for 8. No, 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 no. Because no. 2, what does 2 have to do with, with this parabola? Not a damn thing. 2 has a lot to do with the tangent line. Right, so for any parabola, how many tangent lines are there? How many tangent lines are there to this parabola? Infinitely many, because every time you change A, you get a different slope for a different tangent line. You with me? So this is really just asking, I want the tangent line that goes through this. Right, or, or let me make it better. This, that'd be more like what we're saying. So there's a tangent line, so this would work, right? And, and so would... That would work too. Hey, that's all we're doing. We're finding those two. So how do you find the equation of a line? I gotta first find a point. They gave me a point Q. So the only thing I don't know is the slopes. Yes, sir. How can you find the two different slopes? Alright, so I so know how you can find one by just you do what is that? What's the slope between this point and that point? What's that slope? These two points, what's the slope? Just two A. So y2 minus y1. Keep going. A squared plus a plus 3. Over x2 minus x1. And that this slope has to equal what? What else up there is the slope of a? Yeah, those have to be equal to each other. Now that's algebra. Solve that equation. You'll get two answers. Why will we get two answers? Right? And a times a, is, but it's two a squared. Your a squared would be left alive. You're going to get two answers that relate to the two tangent lines. I'm not saying, no, don't get me wrong, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm upset because I'm letting myself explain too much. I want you to take what I've said and see if it makes sense and go with it. I've said too much. So if I haven't said enough for you, that's wrong. I've actually said too much. I want you to Get into this problem. See why it makes sense. 176 is where you start to play with math, and this is, that's not where you end playing with math. That was the beginning. Now you continue to play. Okay. Playing is not just allowed. It's, it's required. Isn't the A, um, A squared plus A, that's just the slope of the line? Though. No, no, no. Careful. What is this? That's a point. That is, any, that is the point that, you know, if X is A, this is the point on that parabola. That's all. That's all that means by itself. Okay, so you just gave the slope of any point on that. Exactly. To that one. Exactly. But I specifically want that to be the slope at A. So that's really the connection. 
So you're going to get two answers for that, right? Yeah, because you're going to have an A squared left alive. There you go. Fundamental theorem of algebra says you have to have the same number of answers as you have degree. Highest degree. I don't know if you guys remember that. Sounds important. We're going to have two fundamental theorems of calculus later. Yay! All right. Anything else from homework? Yes? I had a question on 2.8 and uh, 27. Oh, yeah. Mm. Mm. Sorry. Uh, all right. I'm just imagining everything that can go wrong with that problem. So this one, remember, chapter 3 is where we start knowing the shortcuts. If you're doing a section 2.8 problem, don't be giving me any power rule shit. Right? In fact, this one, we don't even know the rule for this one officially yet. So the function they give us is this guy here, right? Or g of x, anyway. Uh, and they want us to use the definition of derivative to find this guy's derivative. Mmm. Yummy. Yeah. That was creepy. It's too bad it's happening. So, what is the definition of derivative? Yeah, you could do h go to the zero. Sure. F of x plus h. Beautiful. All right. And then you just throw it in there. And what's it seem like it's going to have to happen? What are you going to have to use algebraically to manipulate this? Uh, yes, you got it. Uh, I'm blanking out. The uh, <laughs> conjugate. <laughs> cool. Is that, is that cool, though? Is that good? Just be careful, of course. People always do something like this. What have I done wrong already? You didn't uh, distribute, the negative. distribute the minus, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's little things like that. That actually wouldn't throw it off here too much, but still, little things like that. Drive me crazy for one thing. All right, maybe. Okay. Anything else from homework? Um, number seventy-five on three point one. Oh, yeah, I like it. All right. So here's the thing with uh, differentiability. Wow. So if a function's differentiable somewhere, it's automatically continuous there. But if it's continuous somewhere, it doesn't mean it's differentiable there. So let me give you an example. Uh, the absolute value function is not differentiable here, and we actually talked about that, didn't we? We, we graphed its derivative. And why was it not differentiable at that point? What's the slope back here? So if I, here's f, if I graph f prime, yeah, it's negative one, and then here it's positive one. Shit, so it's not differentiable because its derivative is not continuous. So differentiability is almost like saying, the f prime function itself has to be continuous. So in order for this to be differentiable everywhere, what's the point where it could have a problem? So number 75 says f of x is x squared, x less than or equal to 2, mx plus b, x greater than 2. So find m and b that make it differentiable everywhere. So there's two things really. The derivative has to be continuous, and the function has to be continuous. So you, that you have two unknowns, don't you? M and B. You don't know what M and B are supposed to be, but you have two things you you know is supposed to happen. So what makes the function continuous? How do I make the function continuous? Two points. Um, Where's the only place it could be discontinuous? Zero. At, Two. two. Because below two, or up to two, it's a parabola, that's continuous. And, and above two, it's a line, that's continuous. The only places where they maybe they don't meet. Maybe they don't match, and they're like, oh, shit. So you got to force them to match. How do you do that? So, number one, f of x has got to be continuous. Do it again. Um, you have to set equal x squared to mx plus z, right? 
not just x squared and mx, no, but at what point? Two. 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 So what do you got to make equal? You got to make Two. Four. four equal to 2m two 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 plus, plus b. That's one thing. And you're trying to find it. Oh, oh. Keep going. Second thing, saying, that's one piece of information I know. You with me? Right. And how many unknowns do I have in there? Two. Two. two but I have a whole other thing I can use. And why does it make sense? Whenever I have two variables, I have to have two equations. Oh, yeah. Systems of equations. Oh, yeah. I don't know what they're doing. So, well, how do I do this second piece? It's got to be differentiable. To be differentiable, what's going to happen? The derivatives have to match. So then, of course, you take the derivative. So what's f prime look like? 2x. 2x, x, yeah. Less than equal to 2. And uh, m. M. Exact. So what's m got to be? Four. Okay, I'm going to shut up now. Again, I went way too far. So you knew from the beginning in this problem there were two things you didn't know. You should know there must be two pieces of information they're giving me. What happens if you make m zero and b four? If m is zero, then it's not differentiable because the derivatives don't match. What's the slope at two for this side? <clears throat> okay, good. I like it. So the b derivative of that went away, so it didn't have any control with the derivative. I like it. But see, this is what I mean by playing around. You, and if you don't ever write the derivatives of that down, you're not going to kind of see what to do next. And you're just going to sit there and go, I'm not sure what to do. Well, do something. Do something. You know derivatives have to come into play. Just take derivatives and see what they look like and go, maybe it'll give you an idea what to do next. Instead of sitting there going, I don't see any examples like this. Oh, uh, you're not going to get examples for every problem anymore. And then someday there won't be any examples. At all. If you go far enough. Those are good days. <laughs> That's why, if you don't know what REA is, anybody know REA? No. If you go further, Matthew will. Like Shams. You guys know Shams? What do you guys use nowadays? Study guides. Anybody use study guides? Shams? Holy shit, dudes. <laughs> and do that. REA. Shams. S C H A U M S. You got freaking Google. You got freaking MIT lectures on calculus online. Holy shit. Right? MIT professors, you know, however good I think I might be, they're MIT freaking professors. They might be good to watch. You know, like, I don't understand them. Then you can find somebody else. Um, anyway, sir. So those, those got me through grad school, let me tell you. RAA especially. Uh, okay, anything else from homework? Good, all right, let's get back to where we were. Well, actually, we are right where we were. We didn't get into section 3.2 at all yet. So, they give a rather gross proof of this idea of what we're getting into. Uh, and it's, it, we don't have any rule about what do I do if I'm a function that's the product of two functions. So just to dispel the myth that you can just take the derivative of each one, stay with me now. Whatever, whatever rule applies here has to apply to any product of any two functions. Do you understand? We're going to make a rule, we're going to call it the product rule, which means if I can write it as a product, the rule must work. Right, maybe you guys are I'm just saying words. So. Uh, so if I had this function, what's its derivative? Two x. Two x. So let's write it as a product. What would the product be? That's insane. So if I think the product rule should be take each piece's derivative separately, I would get one times one. Is that right? No. All right. We can scrap that shit. Right. You cannot take the derivative of parts of a product and expect to get anything good. All right, let me make sure you understand. You cannot do that. There's the proof. To prove that you can't do something, I just have to show you one counterexample. I don't care if it works anywhere. It doesn't work always. Screw it. All right, so let's get something better. I don't like the book's proof. The book's proof is ugly. 
And that's okay, Stuart. You do other things good, too. But let's, let's look at a better proof. Uh, and you guys aren't going to like this at first, but this is nothing you have to do anymore. We're going to use the definition of derivative to prove rules, which we can then just apply the rules. Right? That's the whole point of math. So what's the remind me? What's the definition of derivative? Limit of h to gross zero, f of x plus h. Now again, now see that. Look at so it's going to be f of x plus h minus h times g of x plus h. That's the that's the function, right? H of x plus h is f of x plus h times g of x plus h minus f of x g of x. Right. I'm using this function there, right? All over h h. Okay, now what I'm about to do is pull them apart. I can't. So what I'm about to do will be very strange. This might be the first time you guys have seen this kind of thing. No, I think in trig, this might happen a couple times, depending on if your teacher hit it. This happens so often in math. I'm going to add and subtract the same thing. All right? I just give myself straight. I did this earlier, so I remember what it is. I want to add and subtract. Add, uh, what are you going to add, Jeff? I forgot. Oh, let me subtract and add. There. You don't have to write this down if you don't want to. Some of you guys are trying to write this down. All right, let me make sure you guys understand. This, these two things are the only new things. And this is the same as that because I canceled them out of the way, right? Obviously, I'm not going to put them there for a reason. All right, so here's what's neat. Uh, stay with me. It's kind of cool. I like this so much better. The books are just... Uh, uh, let me break this into two parts. What can come out of this? these parts here? This part. Yeah, f of x plus h times... What will be left? g of x plus h minus g of x. You, get, you guys see what I'm doing here? You're taking the F? Yeah, so the F comes out of these two, and these two over H. Now, this is still over H, isn't it? Yes. All right, all right. Let me make sure you guys are kind of with me. So then I have plus, and there's a limit in front of all of this. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. G of X. yeah, so G of X. Holy shit, sorry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited because this is cool shit. Uh, G of X can come out, and what's left? Yeah, where am I at? No, right. I'm here. I mean, that's so big and that's so small. So F of X plus H minus, I heard that. <laughs> F of X over H. That's my thing. Michael Scott. No? No office. Office. Uh, so what is this? What is the, now, now what can I do? with the limit of a product. Now, the limit I can do to both pieces, right? Yeah. What's the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h? f of x. F of x. And what the hell is this? Zero. That's the definition of... What's that the definition of? Limit as g of x plus h minus g of x over h. That is the definition of derivative of g, which I write as g prime. Good. Plus g of x times f prime, because it limits in front of everybody, right? There you go. Let's collect what we just did. Figure out what the hell we just did. This is kind of cool. And then we'll, we'll sort of, not prove it, because this is the proof, but we'll try it on a few problems, like the x squared thing. We'll see if it does that correctly. So we put up here what we got. We got this. If I have n to of x, a equals f of x, g of x, h prime of x equals, uh, let me just rearrange this a little bit. Let me turn this around. That is the prodigal. So what all that says is each function gets a term. And we're going to see this a few times, actually. Each function gets its own term. You don't take derivatives of both all at once. So let's try it with uh, something silly, and then we'll try it with something that really needs it. Uh, well, actually, we'll 
Until we know chain rule, this is going to be sort of a silly rule. <laughs> You'll see what I mean in a second. But uh, remember earlier we had this, which we wrote as that. Yeah. So this is f and this is g. Is that correct? Yeah. So then using the rule, h prime would be one. x prime times x plus g prime, no, no x, times. x times x prime. Right? They each get a term. So what's x prime? One. 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 one times x is x plus one times x is 2x, which is what the derivative of x squared is. Cool. And of course it's going to work. We just proved the damn thing. Right? But it gives you what you're supposed to get. Sorry. Do you see it? Uh, let's do one that's a little more interesting than something we could do. Uh, this is only going to be a little more interesting, so... Sorry. Uh, let's say I had f of x equals... Uh, what you got, Jeff? x cubed minus 4 times x squared plus 7. I like that. Now you could foil this out, right? And until we learn something called chain rule, we're not going to get to the problems that really make product rule, you realize how important product rule is. But let's just try this out. So how would I do this using the product rule? I don't feel like foiling this shit out. <laughs> so you get the derivative of 2x times x cubed. What's happening? Oh, <laughs> 2x squared. I'm 3x. I mean 3x. 3x squared times? x squared plus 7. x squared plus 7. Plus, plus uh, 2x. x cubed minus 4 times 2x. 2x. Cool. So, derivative the first, leave the second alone, plus the root, uh, leave the first alone, derivative the second. They each get it their own term. That's the product rule. Pop. And then I just have to distribute. And there's no like terms. Oh, there's there's there. We got 5x4 plus 21x squared minus 8x. Neato. And real quick, if I did multiply this out. Why would you go from the way the steps That's what I said earlier. Uh, so right now, until we learn chain rule, what chain rule is going to do for us is, can you imagine if I would have put a 90th power there? I, I don't want to foil it out, but the reason I cannot, I don't have a rule at the moment to handle this is because the inside is more complicated than just x. So every function we've looked at so far, there has not been a true separate function of x inside of something else. So this, the product rule would eat this up, but this part would have to require the chain rule to help do it. So the product rule is incredibly important, but if you only know product rule, you start to go, well, why the hell would I do that shit? And I totally agree with you. There ain't no way I would do this shit if I had this problem. I'd just foil it out and then attack it, right? But I just want to make sure that you understand that it works. And until we learn chain rule, then, then we'll be able to handle any damn thing. Uh, so if I did foil this out first, what do you get? Works very much funny. Yeah, okay. So what's f prime? We do it this way. Same thing, of course, right? Same thing. Cool. All right. Cool. All right. All right. All right. So that's product rule. It's it let it. Oh, you will love product rule because it's the easiest rule besides power rule that there is. Ah. Uh, to be honest, the next rule I'm going to show you, when I was a student, I never used it. So I'm going to show it to you, and, and now that I teach, I'm like, oh yeah, it actually is useful. Uh, <laughs> and of course, once you get a little bit past Calc 1, you realize, oh shit, that is useful. So later in my math career, I used it. Uh, but I will show you, yeah, quotient rule. So I'll, I'll show you quotient rule. I'm not going to prove this one because it's, it's a lot like the other one. I want to get to the point today where I talk about chain rule, and then uh, tomorrow, hey, today's Wednesday, we have more time today, it's good. Uh, and then tomorrow I'm probably going to bring a little handout and let you guys work in groups on all these rules to make sure that we got them down.
Uh, here's quotient rule. And, and, and remarkably enough, quotient rule handles a case where there's a quotient. What? I don't know. <laughs> Math people. We name things well sometimes. <laughs> so now, now I want you to realize something. Uh, I could rewrite this as f of x times g of x to the negative 1. Is that, did you guys see that? Yeah. I'm being very careful to not write that as g inverse. That is g of x to the negative, so that's the reciprocal of g of x. And then I could use product rule. If I knew chain rule, why would I need chain rule? Because there's something inside of something else that I would have to have chain rule do for me. Right. So I, that's the way I would do this, but we don't know chain rule yet, it's too bad for us. So how do we do that? Now, now, notice, which one of these has a negative on it? This one. And what would the power rule say here? What would happen here? The power rule would say negative 1 would come down, and this would become negative 2. Negative two. And then chain rule would do some of its own shit, right? So chain rule's coming. So that realizing that helps you remember what this looks like. So this is going to be a lot like product rule, except this is going to have a negative on it. So watch this, it's a lot like product rule. It's going to be f prime g. And then it would normally be plus f g prime for just a product rule, but it's not going to be that because the g has a freaking negative on it. So it be minus f g prime. So why does it make sense? When I take the derivative of g, it was on the bottom, so its term is going to be negative. There's all these stupid songs. I don't hate songs. But I don't necessarily like them in teaching because it removes you from the idea a little bit. So I don't know if anybody knows the Heidi Ho song. Yeah. Yeah. If it helps you, sweet. I always turn shit around. Here's my song. You ready? Here's my song. You ready? This okay. is it. Top first. That's it. That's all you gotta remember. Top first. If you had this turn around, you got the wrong sign on your slope. Right? That's all you want me to sing. <laughs> I can do Louis Armstrong. Top first. <laughs> and then now watch. What did I say happens with this? The product rule, the negative one come down, this will become a Square. negative two. So it'll be g squared on the bottom. That's exactly what it is. Yes? Oh, jeez. You sing it for him. I don't even. Oh, low di minus high di low. Ho, ho, ho. Yeah, so <laughs> low, and away we go. Low, D high. And where's what's the D mean? Because what's another way to write that prime? D by DX, right? You with me? You with me? So the song, I don't even want to cheat. Low, D high minus high, low, square the bottom. Huh? No, obviously I'm not going to do this. All right, you guys can look it up if you want to. But I, to me, it makes it's better if you make the connection as, as to why that makes sense instead of a song that'll just remove you from the math. Uh, and I'm not against mnemonic devices. I'm not against this kind of stuff. But there's too many of them out there, I think. Right? You're like, ah, oh, screw you, Joe. Well, that's fine. If, if they get you through, okay. But you're not making as many connections as you should be, which, which, is, which is too bad. All right. Let's try one of these out just to see what it looks like. And then we'll get into the chain rule. I keep talking about how important the chain rule is. All right, so here's the quotient rule, dude. So let's see if we had. Uh, don't really matter. Sure. I like it. Now, now, real quick, if you're asked to pick a derivative of something, and there's an algebraic simplification you can do. Yes. So for example, if this would have been an 8, you could have factored top and bottom and killed something, right? Yeah. Hell yes, do it. You guys got it with me? All right, maybe, maybe. All right, all right. But all right, I can't. It's not an 8. Uh, so so how does this work? F prime. And, and let me let me... I really want to make a big deal of this right now, and I did it with uh, product rule a little bit, but I really want to make a big deal out of this. Write the rule and then do the derivatives. What do I mean? I'm not going to do any derivatives at first. And some of you guys are not going to want to do that, but when we start getting more and more complicated functions, you're going to get lost a little bit trying to do everything at once. 
So what I mean is the rule is top first. <laughs> top first. So derivative of the top times the bottom minus the top times the derivative of the bottom all over bottom squared. Trust me on this. It will simplify your life. You'll remember the rules better because you'll continuously be writing them out. You're not going to make little mistakes trying to do too much at once. I would say you want us to simplify or can we just... What do you mean? Like, you want us to simplify uh, everything out? I know. Of course I do. Because it's the thing you got to do. So, so what's the derivative here? Sorry. It's 2x minus 2. Good, good, good. 4x plus minus 1. Uh, x squared minus 2x times 4. Okay. So I, I, I really... All right, two things I want to say here. If you just stop there, it's obviously nowhere near, near good enough. So many things might cancel or something might happen, right? Uh, yeah, so you must simplify. Um, and it is part of it to know when to stop. So don't just stop now just because I'm not sure when to stop if I start going. You no, know, it's all part of it is to know when to stop. Uh, and please, dear God, please, dear God, you cannot cancel those, right? <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, like, oh, it's the right thing to do. Found here, you know. That's, you can't break into a subtraction problem. You cannot. What's being divided by two of these? Both of these are being divided by two of these. So if I killed one, how did that guy escape? That's not fair. Now he's only being divided by one. He's like, oh, that's great. That's not fair. I mean, people are still going to do that. Just like people are going to tell me square to 9 minus x squared is 3 minus x until I go insane. I might already be there. I don't know. And now, so what do I do? Yeah, so we get 8x squared minus 8x minus 2, so minus 10x plus 2 minus x squared. Let's do 4 in there. Plus 8x. Ah, the purple's dead. Go away. And just leave this like that. That's fine. God, both my purples are dead. Poor little guys. So I get 8x squared minus 4x squared is 4x squared minus 2x. Uh, don't forget anybody. 4x squared minus 2x plus 2. All over 4x minus 1 squared. And this, can it factor? Actually, yeah. It it might factor, but it won't be factoring into 4x minus 1, will it? No. No, it won't. There's a 1. Yeah. So you can stop right there. That's good enough. Cool. All right, how are we doing there? So then, what's the, uh, so now why? I want you to realize. I can ask you, find the equation of the tangent line to f of x at x equal to, oh, it doesn't matter from evil, because I teach math. Old question. Old question. I know it's like a week old, but it won't. And it actually is much older than that, isn't it? It's just that we now that we have calculus, we have one more way to get the we have one more way to get the what do we need for the equation of the tangent line? Slope. Slope, slope. and a point. So we have one more way to get the slope now. So we know the derivative of f everywhere. So I can find the derivative of f at one. All right, so what is f prime at 1? What is it? 4 ninths? 6, 4 ninths. Cool. And what else do I need? A point. A point. Do I have it? Oh, you only have one. Yeah, so like 1. And where do I plug 1? Yeah, yeah, this is going to become incredibly huge later about, all right, am I going to plug it into f or f prime or f double prime? Uh, and you got to plug it in the right one. you got to know what it is you're trying to figure out right then. You have to know what each of those represents. So right now, I just need the actual point the function goes through. So of course I'm going to go there. I don't need something about the slope. Where I got the slope. So when I plug a 1 in... Negative 1 third. Negative 1 third? I'm going to trust you. And then you just do y goes mx with b or whatever. You guys with me? Now this is something I can ask my Math 90 students tomorrow. 
right? If I give them the slope and I give them a point, they can give me the equation of one. Right? And yes, I am just trying to make you feel bad if you're not sure how to do it. <laughs> so that might be a little question. So you could just do this, or mx plus b and solve for b, whatever you want to do. We've done this before. You guys with me? So y minus negative one third equals four ninths times x minus one, and then simplify it a little bit, you're done. So all these rules can be used to answer the same kind of question you've seen before. Because the rules are used to get slopes, and slopes are what is needed for tangent lines. Okay, maybe, maybe. Maybe shark. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe. Alright. That's exciting. So yes, I, I realize I'm throwing a lot at you today because I want this all out there so tomorrow we can do all of it on this little handout thing. Um, any questions about that so far? Quotient rule? Let me let you try one on your own while I'm thinking about it. Use the quotient rule to get this guy's derivative. Who is it, Jeff? I don't know. Oh yeah, good. Oh. 